This video is going to be the second episode of my sort of home automation, self-hosted home automation mini series I've been doing. And if you haven't seen the previous one, I'll put a card up because it's probably worth watching that first because it shows a bit of the prerequisites for this. But today I'm going to be replacing my current smart heating system with a new one based around Node-RED. A good couple of years ago now, I built my own smart central heating control system using a Sonoff smart switch with custom firmware I wrote and custom Python software that I run on my server. And it works absolutely brilliantly. Like I don't actually need to replace it at all. But now that I've moved my home automation over to Node-RED and I'm using Zigbee to MQTT, I fancied also moving the smart heating over. So I thought, why not look at a cheap Zigbee thermostat to see how this works? Because while with the Sonoff, I had to, it works amazingly, but I had to write custom firmware, make modifications to the hardware and do a lot of work. You can now get these Zigbee thermostats fairly cheap and then use the hardware totally stock. So I'll need to make no modifications to the hardware or flash any firmware. In theory, I can just plug this in and it'll work totally out of the box. So as I mentioned, I'm using a Zigbee thermostat and that's this one here. This is from a brand called Moe's and the particular model is a BHT002 GCLZB. And this is listed as supported by Zigbee to MQTT, which is why I'm using it. Unfortunately, it's not particularly widely available in the UK. I can't find it on Amazon, for example, but I was able to buy this from AliExpress for $26.99 delivered, and that includes tax and everything, so that's not bad at all. And it came in about 10 days, so that's not, not a problem. And I'll put links to buy this in the description. They sell this in a couple of different versions. So the main things they sell are different protocols, so you can get the Zigbee version or the Wi-Fi version. The Wi-Fi version is very widely available, including on Amazon, which is why I almost made a mistake and bought the Wi-Fi one because I didn't really realise the listing because if you search Zigbee thermostat on Amazon, it'll bring up the Wi-Fi version of this, which is a bit tricky, a bit annoying. So yeah, they sell the Wi-Fi version. But as I mentioned in my previous video about the smart home stuff, a lot of my rationale behind this is I don't want to have any cloud involvement or any external manufacturers having involvement. And with the Wi-Fi version, it's another one of those two your smart devices that talks out to the two your servers and uses their cloud environment to actually control it. And while it does have a local API, to actually get the credentials to connect to that, you need to register as, as a two-year developer, adopt the device into the two-year cloud environment, and then get the credentials out of that, which I don't want. And while yes, you can flash custom firmware onto the two-year devices, and then they would work locally over the network, I really don't fancy doing that. So that's why I've gone for the Zigbee model, because it'll connect to Zigbee to MQTT running on my Raspberry Pi, bridge this device over to MQTT without making any modifications to the device, and I can control it directly from Node-RED. So as I mentioned, that's the model number there. That's the Zigbee version. And then there's a couple of other model differences you'll see. You get different colours. They say black, they do black and white. I've seen pictures of other colours, but the ones I've generally found are black or white, so I've gone for the white one. And then the next one is the type of heating. There's three different versions. This one is boiler heating, which is what I've got. I've got a gas combi boiler. But they also do a version that they call water heating and one they call electric heating. The electric heating one's fairly self-explanatory. It's just exactly the same as this. It just has a higher current relay, so it can switch a 16 amp electric heating load. This one only has a five amp relay because it's not switching an actual heating element. It's just sending control signals to a boiler. The water heating one was a bit more confusing because it's a system obviously that I'm not used to, but I think it's for water under floor heating because it's got, where this has like a relay contact for the output, the water version has like two outputs, one labelled open, one labelled close. So I think it's to control water valves or something. So I didn't go for that either. So I got the combi boiler, central heat, the boiler heating one they call it. So yeah, if you're buying this, just make sure you get the right model. Definitely make sure you get the Zigbee model if you're looking for a Zigbee one because they get mixed up quite easily. Pick the colour and then pick what type of heating you want. And I imagine if you've got like you know, a normal gas combi boiler like people in the UK have, you'll want this particular model here. Now obviously this will only work for a combi boiler, it doesn't have any functionality for hot water control separate from your heating control. So yeah, you wouldn't be able to use this if you need a if you need hot water control as well, but for me I've got combi so it'll work fine. And yep, $26.99 which seems like a good price. So first of all we'll take a look at the hardware. We'll take it out, we'll try it, connect it up and try it out and just do a quick test with MQTT. And then I'll actually install it and show briefly show the installation process. Then I'll go away, set up the flows in Node-RED, and then we'll come back and take a look at it all working. And this will be a very long video, so I'll put the timestamps in the video description and in the description and the seek bar so you can skip to the part you're interested in. But there's the thermostat itself. Take that out. See what else we get. We get a quality control thing, a couple of screws, a manual which it'll detail us, I presume, yeah, all the wiring stuff for it. But then 
also it shows all the app control stuff for using their Tuya Smart Life app, which all these devices use, all these cheaper smart home devices, the thermostats, the bulbs, the TRVs and stuff, they all use this Tuya Smart system. So that would only happen obviously if you bought their specific hub and used it with that. But because it's a generic Zigbee device, we can use it with Zigbee to MQTT and not use any of their software. That's all the wiring there. And yet you can see there, there's the three different versions. So it shows that's the version I've got there, the boiler one, which has a dry contact. This one, which shows like a resistive heating element because that's a higher current load. And this shows that weird symbol with the pump and then the open close things. So don't know what that is. But anyway, get out of the way. Here is the thermostat. And actually it feels, I mean, obviously I've not, I've not actually looked at it yet, but it feels good quality. Like it just, it's it's got a lot of weight to it. The plastic feels quite, like actually really quite thick and rigid. Like it's not got any flex to it. And it's got this metal back plate. So it does feel pretty good quality so far anyway. And while I was a bit worried buying a, you know, a sort of mains powered central heating controller from AliExpress, the fact that this is actually sold on Amazon and like from UK suppliers, just not the Zigbee version, they sell the Wi-Fi version of the exact same thing, maybe a, maybe a bit more comfortable. And it is, you know, CE marked, FCC certified. Again, obviously they can fake that, but hopefully not. And I did also notice on the box that there is actually like a European distributor in Germany, I think that would be. So yeah, it's there is at least some involvement with, you know, supplying this to, the, to Europe. So it's not a totally dubious device, hopefully. But yeah, that's it there. So now let's take a closer look at the hardware. So we see here we have the front where we've got this big LCD screen and a few sort of capacitive touch buttons. We'll take a look at this when we power it on. You've got the Moe's logo, which is obviously the brand. On the bottom, you've got you've got the little, oh, dropped it. You've got the little thermistor. So there's a little, presumably NTC thermistor, I think it said, sticking out the bottom. And that's what will send to temperature. So it's sitting out there quite nicely in free air. So it'll hopefully react quite quickly to temperature changes. And then around the back, we can see the connections. So what you've got, you've got your live and neutral in, so your mains input, and then you've got a dry contact. So this is quite good. So what it means is essentially you've got, it's mains powered, and then you've got a relay that switches on and off based on the heating, but it doesn't necessarily switch the mains to the output. So it means if your boiler takes a low voltage signal to switch on or off or a zero volt signal, you could actually use it with this by just wiring it across the relay. Or if you're like me and your boiler uses a switch live to turn on, on or off, you would just need to essentially put a link between the live terminal and one of the relay contacts and then have the switch live come out the relay. So that'd be absolutely fine. I'll show the wiring later, but obviously I'm not an electrician and do not assume the wiring I've done here will match your system. So yeah, you need to really understand what you're doing to actually install one of these, but yeah, that's the connections on the back. Then on the side here, you've got a thing for a, a, well, a pair of terminals for an NTC thermistor. So you can actually apparently fit an external temperature sensor as well. So you can wire it into there. I can't see anything in the manual about how you use that or you know how do you enable it or does it detect it being plugged in there and switch off the internal one? I'm really not sure. So I'd probably use that as your, at your own risk. They do mention the type there as a 10K3950. So you'd probably need to be careful to get the right one because obviously I presume you can't calibrate this. So you need to get one that actually matches the characteristics that this expects. Otherwise the temperature readings will be way off. They did also seem to sell these with bundled with thermistors if you wanted them but I'm not going to use that. I'm just going to use the built-in one because it's sitting in my hallway, which is fine. There's also this little thing here for Modbus, but it seems to be blanked out, so I presume it's not installed. I think you could do some sort of Modbus control on it, you know, link it out to that, but yeah, that's blanked out, so I can't use that, unfortunately, but I wasn't planning on using that anyway. So that's the hardware there. And actually for mounting this, it's actually really nice. So on the back, you've got these two screws here, which are spaced correctly to fit on like a UK Patras box, I don't know about Europe ones, I suspect they're maybe similar. I don't know, you need to check the dimensions. But yeah, you've got these two screws here, so I can just mount this onto a standard Patras box. And in order to get this nice screwless look on the front, what actually happens is this back plate here, which is metal as well, which explains why it's so heavy, this back plate slides off. So what you can do is you can have it on your wall, slide the thermostat off, pull the front plate off like that, the two parts come apart, and then it's plugged into here. So you can then unplug it like that, that then comes off, so this is the part that's mounted on the wall with the power supply circuitry in the back of it. And then this part clips over it. It would have been nice to see like a, you know, screw or something to like secure this on, because obviously if that's on the wall, anyone can pull this off. 
it's not really a safety risk because the actual power supply stuff seems to be in the back here. So I imagine this is just low voltage stuff. So, you, you know, you're not putting yourself at risk really having that off the wall. But, you know, it could mean that someone could steal it off the wall. So, I mean, you're, it'll be fine in a home environment. Maybe obviously a bit more of an issue if you're putting it in a commercial setting because you could just literally pull that off the wall if you're fiddling with it. But, yeah, it's, it's fine. So that's it there. So before we actually fire it up, we'll just quickly pop it open and take a look at the parts inside. Obviously, this won't necessarily be interesting to everyone, but this is more of a very in-depth look at this and sort of, you know, me showing what I'm interested in. So I want to take a look at the components and see how this works. Obviously, if you're just interested in just seeing this working and seeing it installed, feel free to skip ahead. Okay, so let's pop this open and see what's inside. So there's just four Phillips one screws around the outside, so we can just take these out. I'm just interested to see what this has inside. Obviously, the actual relay and stuff's clearly in that back plate, so this is just going to be a bit more digital stuff. But I'll just take a quick look. Kind of always interested to see what's in these. So, undo those four screws. And this will hopefully pop off. There we go. And that's the inside. So, I'm now going away and looked up some of the part numbers. So, let's take a look at them. So, first over here, we've got this module here, which is labelled TYZS3. And this is a Tuya Zigbee module. So I've mentioned the whole Tuya system. They're a sort of big company that makes a sort of smart home platform with a big cloud environment. And they also sell these modules. So this is their Zigbee module that a manufacturer can just put into their device and this will handle all the communication with the Tuya Zigbee hub that then goes out to the cloud and all that sort of stuff. They also sell a Wi-Fi version, so a sort of Wi-Fi module exactly the same as this, that I imagine you can kind of just plug in instead of this. And instead of connecting out to a Zigbee hub, it'll connect directly to the network and connect out to their cloud. So this means that a manufacturer, and this is why there's so many Tuya devices, a manufacturer can just build a thermostat, plug one of those devices into it, and make it smart. So as I mentioned, that's a Zigbee module, and that has an ARM M4 CPU in it, runs free RTOS, and has just a bunch of GPIO and UARTs. And if you look at the pin out here, they're using one of the GPIOs and, a pair, and one of the UARTs to connect to the main CPU. So that's obviously how this works. And we can see over here, the model number actually says BAC002 Wi-Fi. So I suspect this is the exact same sort of board you would use in the one that's Wi-Fi. And the only difference would be that they'd swap out the Zigbee module for the Wi-Fi module. It's definitely a smart way of doing it. I just don't really like the idea of the two-year cloud environment, but it's a smart way of manufacturing a device like that, quite cheap. Next over here, we've got the main CPU. This is a Sonics SN8F57084SG. Yeah, I think I got that right. This is an 8-bit microcontroller, and it's a Intel 8051 compatible, so it's just a very basic microcontroller. And that'll presumably be connected up to, over, to the 2 year module over UART. So this will be handling all the sort of standalone interface and thermostat type stuff, and then it'll communicate with this, which will do all the smart stuff. Next over here, you've got this Holtec chip, which is an HT1621B, and this is an LCD driver. So it's designed for this LCD here that's just a sort of multi-segment LCD, it's not dot matrix or anything, it's just a multi-segment LCD. And all this will do is let the, C the CPU control all those different elements on the screen. Finally down here is this little chip here, and this is an ICMAN SC05B. This is a touch controller, so I suspect it's for these capacitive controls here. It maybe handles all the sort of capacitive sensing and like auto calibration type stuff it'll do for these capacitive controls, so that's all that is there. Then there's a couple more tiny little chips up here. You've got this one on the right here, which is a 24C02. It's just a 2K serial EEPROM, so that'll store firmware. Either for the microcontroller or the Holtec chip. Can't quite see where the traces are going, but yeah, a little EEPROM there. And then over here, you've got a Holtec HT1381. And this is a serial timekeeper chip. So what this seems to do is just basically be a clock. It just stores the time and accurately counts the time along and actually increments it and runs, you know, manages time. I suppose it makes more sense than having something built into the microcontroller just because this thing does have a timer and a clock on it. So it needs to be very accurate. You don't want any sort of drift happening. So I suppose it makes sense to offload that to a separate chip. But yeah, it's a very simple device. Nothing really particularly to write home about. I'm probably a bit off topic actually taking this apart, but I thought it'd be a bit fun to look into. Next up, we've got the back piece here that I presume contains the relay and power supply. I don't know how feasible this will be to take apart, but I'll try and pop it open. The screws are very stiff, so I'm going to be a bit careful because I don't want to totally knacker it. So if I start having issues, I'll just give up on this bit. 
cool. So those screws were an absolute nightmare to take out, but I got them out and then that bit just sort of fell off. And then I don't know how I'll be able to get that out. I can see it's sort of clipped in the corners there, which look kind of moulded in. Don't know if I maybe push from these connectors or that. Push. Yeah, there we go, that pops out. Cool. So hopefully we can then maybe slowly lever this out. Now, I'm not Big Clive, so I can't really fully reverse engineer this or anything, but take a quick look. So, looks reasonable on the top here. There's, you know, big cutouts for isolation and stuff. Very basic, got transformer there. Mains inputs here, which are actually quite nice because they're rising clamp terminals. So, this is like, I don't know why this isn't more common on electrical accessories where you've actually got a rising clamp that clamps the whole wire. You've not just got a screw screwing down onto a wire, so that's much more secure. So, I do like that. And then yeah, just transformer, capacitor, nothing fancy at all. And then there's the relay there. And we can see on this, because it's the one for just just central heating with a boiler, it's just a five amp relay, because all it needs to do is switch a sort of signal. It's not actually switching a load. Yeah, you can actually see here, there is actually a larger cutout space for the relay here, and you know, bigger slot. So I suspect they might just use this exact same module and just literally put a bigger relay in. And uh, you know, maybe there's different options for pads here for if it's um, that one that's got the open and close one outputs for the valve. I do see here there's actually a couple of like solder pads labelled jump and then this one's soldered over, this one isn't. So I wonder if that lets them kind of like use the same PCB and reconfigure it for the 16 amp relay or the water underfloor heating version that they do. But yeah, I don't really understand the electronics in a huge detail to go into it but at first glance it looks decent enough. So. Yeah, pop this back together and then we'll fire it up, try it out, and then we'll install it. Okay, so that's it reassembled. Just a quick tear down there, just see what it's like inside. And yeah, it seems pretty decent. I can't really fault it at all. So let's now get this up wired up to the mains and try it out. Okay, so I've now wired it all up. Obviously, this is just a test, so I've wired the mains into it and then I've wired this down light out of it. So this just we'll just have a light that will indicate whether the heating's on or off. Obviously, when I'm actually using it, this will be replaced with the boiler. But yeah, that's all wired into the back there. And what we do is we turn it on, so I'll just put it into a plug, so we've turned it on. And it comes on, the lights up. I've had a brief skim of the manual, so I sort of know some of the controls. It's a little bit fiddly, but it's actually not too bad. Um, so you can see it's currently, the room's currently 20 degrees, that's like this, the, room, the actual room temperature it's reading. And if I were to say press these, these, this is like the actual temperature that the thermostat's set to. So you can see it's set 17.5, so because that's cooler than the room, the light won't turn on. Or the heating wouldn't turn on. It always shows this sort of the temperature of the room. So then if I were to set the turn this up to above the room temperature, like that, and wait a little second. This little symbol here comes on, showing that it's like heating the room, it's like little almost like smoke coming out the chimney. And then the light comes on, so it's working. Then in theory, if I were to then hold my thumb on this thermistor, it should start warming it up quite quickly. And then now the light should turn off. There we go. So it's actually working. So thermostat's working and the temperature adjustment's working. So for all I need from this, it works. I can set a temperature, it'll read the room temperature and it'll turn the load off accordingly. There is additional stuff on here, like there's a clock, which is a little bit annoying. I'd rather I didn't, I'd rather I didn't see the clock, to be honest, because I'm not going to use the built-in timer. And the problem is if, if that clock like is wrong, like if I've not set it, it's going to show the wrong number. So I don't know if it, you can auto set it over Zigbee. Let me take a look. Um, but yeah, it's there. There's a couple of other options here. So you've got this button here, which switches it between timer mode and manual mode. Timer mode obviously uses the built-in timers. From what I can see skimming the Zigbee to MQTT documentation, I don't think you can set the timers on this device over MQTT. You probably can over Zigbee, but it doesn't seem to be implemented in Zigbee to MQTT, so you'd probably have to do some custom, like, reverse engineering and sniffing of network protocol to try and figure this stuff out. But yeah, it does have built-in timers, but I won't be using those. Instead, all I'll do is I'll leave it on manual mode and then I'll just have the timers implemented in Node-RED and then Node-RED itself will tell us to turn on, on or off, which is fine. But yeah, you can switch between timer mode or manual mode. I'll just be leaving it on manual. So you see, yeah, it's now turning on because I've put it into timer mode. Then there's this one here for timers, which lets you set the clock and then like it sort of, it cycles through all the different options. So you can see like, that's like a different times, temperatures at different times of day. And there's like four different times of day you can do it on. And then these numbers here represent the days. So that's like one to five was like the weekdays. That's now like obviously Saturday. 
that's like all the weekdays we're going through. Saturday, all yeah, all the different times on a Saturday, <laughs> all different times on a Sunday. This makes me realise why I like having a smart heating thing because it's much easier to set this on a phone than this sort of style of interface. But yeah, it does have built-in timers. Now I won't be using these. I'll just leave it on manual mode of this, as I said, and I'll do the timers in no dread. But it'll be nice having this sort of control because we'll see my current system in a second. But the problem with it is that there's no local control at all. So if my network goes down or the server goes down or I'm just, you know, doing network maintenance and I've taken stuff down, I can't actually control the heating. So you'll see in a second I've actually had to add a manual thermostat in just so I can control the heating if everything's off. What this at least means is not only can I control the temperature on it from the device itself, even if everything else is down, because, you know, this isn't even currently connected to Zigbee. It also means that if I've had like a prolonged outage, you know, I've completely broken everything, everything's down, server's being rebuilt and, and something's going to take me a few days to fix or whatever. I can actually go onto this and set up some timers and have it work like a dumb, normal heating programmer. You don't actually need any of the smart stuff to actually just have, you know, four timers and some, day, some days. So it's some day-based timers. So it is really good actually having that built in, but I'll just be using the manual control and controlling it over Zigbee. But yeah, it seems quite nice. The controls are fairly responsive. The only thing I, can seem, I can't seem to find is I can't seem to find a way to switch it off but leaving the screen on. So you've got this big, this, it's, it's quite hard to see on camera, there's this little ring here which actually does light up, which is good, you can see it in the dark. And that turns the whole thing on or off, so that turns the heating off, turn it on again, the screen comes on and then it'll start operating again. So it seems like if you want the heating to be switched off properly, like it, so it's not using the thermostat, so it's actually turned off, it'll actually turn the screen off as well. That's a bit of a shame because I'd quite like to be able to like just have a sort of room thermostat or thermometer I can just look at walking past it, whereas it seems if the heating's off the screen will just be blank. I can maybe get around that by just instead of turning it on or off just like if I don't want the heating on just set this down to like five degrees so it is essentially off and that would maybe provide some sort of frost protection as well but yeah seems to work pretty well. So what I'll now do is we'll grab the laptop and try and connect this to Zigbee. Okay, so now let's try and pair this to Zigbee to MQTT. So here we've got Zigbee to MQTT here. There's a slight spoiler in that for a future video, so subscribe and turn on notifications if you want to see that. But what we can do is we can press permit join all, so that'll enable us to join new devices. So now let's try and pair the thermostat. And apparently all we need to do is if we turn it off at the switch here, and then hold down the down arrow for a while, I think it said eight seconds, we should get a symbol appear on the screen, and the screen should start flashing, hopefully. There we go, so the screen's now flashing, we've got like a little Wi-Fi symbol, or radio symbol there. And if we go over to Zigbee to MQTT, hopefully... Oh, did it already, that was really quick. So we can now see here that the heating programmer is now paired. So I'll give it a name again just to make it much easier to work with. So heating controller, save changes. And now if we click into this, here we can see it. So it's picked up straight away, it's picked up the model and everything. And then if we go to Exposy, this gives us some level of control. So we can go through here, we've got the heating set point, system mode, etc. So for example, system mode's currently off, which is correct. If we turn on, if we press heat, it turns on. And after a second, light turns on. Turn it off there. Light turns off. That should be on again. Yep, the, the room's obviously heated up, so it's now above the temperature threshold, so it's gone off. But in theory here I can then change the set heating set point, so I can say put in 25 and then that should potentially yep, increase the set point. You can see the screen's actually come on and sh shown the set point change in there, which is quite cool. It's turned on. If I then set this down to say 10 degrees. The interface is a little bit fiddly. I think you need to like almost press enter and then click out. There you go. And you can see it's now showing 10 degrees and it'll turn off. So it's nice that it actually shows the set point changing on this interface, which is quite cool. So yeah, that seems to work fine. Now I wonder what happens if I change the temperature on this. So we change the temperature there to 15 degrees. Awesome, there we go. So you can see actually changing the temperature on the thermostat actually changed the state in Zigbee to MQTT. So I imagine this will be publishing over MQTT as well. That's really good. So it means if I, I can actually happily change the temperature on this just when I'm walking past it and it'll automatically reflect it within Node-RED. So I won't have like a different temperature in Node-RED to what's actually set on the device. So that's really good, you got that two-way communication there. What if I turn the heating off? 
turn heating off here. Come on. There we go. Yep, you can see here that system mode is actually turned off. So it's system mode off, turn it on. Come on. It's like fiddly control. And it's now turned system mode to heat. So that's really good as well. So actually the local controls are actually being reflected in Zigbee to MQTT. So I am actually happy now controlling this here and having it reflect on the other, other end. So that's really good. There's also this child lock here, I think. So you can set lock and then that puts like a little padlock symbol on the screen. And if that's on there, none of the controls on the device work. So you can also turn child mode, like child lock off just by like holding a couple of buttons down. So you could use that if you don't want people fiddling with it, but I'll probably leave it unlocked because it will be nice actually being able to just set the temperature or switch the heating off, especially if I'm going out the door from this device. It maybe won't be ideal in the sense that like the time, I don't know how it works with timers, but anyways, it's nice at least that I can just adjust the temperature from this. I don't have to use my phone, which is good. So that's a look at Zigbee to MQTT there. Now let's take a look at actually, actually controlling this over MQTT. So now let's quickly take a look at the MQTT side of things. Obviously I'll properly set this up in Node-RED, but we'll just check it's working. So we're just using MQTT Explorer again, it just lets me quickly control stuff so we can see Zigbee to MQTT there. There's heating controller, so it is actually publishing some of its own sort of stats periodically. So we can see it's got a temperature readout here and stuff. So current heating set point 15, local temperature 21, so that seems to work fine. I presume if I were then to change the set point on the thermostat itself, like that, turn it up a little bit. Once that goes out the menu, you can see there, it's actually updated the set point within MQTT as well. So that's working. So it is actually reliably reflecting both ways. And now hopefully here, I can start actually sending messages to control it. So if I were to send a message of, uh, what, is, what do they call it? Current heating set point and I'll set this to 25 degrees. That should turn up the temperature to 25 degrees and then hopefully turn the load on. So send that. Screen's lit up showing it's changing. Little smoke symbols come on and it's working. And then if I were then say, right, and I want to change system mode. I can't type. There we go. And I'll set the system mode to off. Publish that. It turns off and also turns off the load. Then change that back to heat. Publish that, comes back on, and the light comes on. So that's good, so it is actually working. So that's really the only control I need from MQTT, is just the ability to turn it on and off and set the temperature, because everything else can be done in Node-RED. And obviously the fact that I can read the temperature out is obviously really good as well. So I can just pull it out, show it in the interface, make a little graph of it or whatever. So yeah, that MQTT side of things seems to work really well as well. So all we now need to do is dismantle this whole test rig and then actually install it. Because what I'll do is I'll install it. I'll then build all the no dread stuff and I'll go away and use it for a bit off camera just to get used to it because I imagine I'll probably end up changing stuff over time, just finding how I prefer to use the system. So I'll do that for a bit and then once I'm happy with it and I've got a, a relatively finished version, I'll then come back and show it working in Node-RED. And the other thing I've just noticed off camera here is it has actually picked up the time automatically over Zigbee to MQTT or over Zigbee or somewhere in the system. It is picking up the time. So I presume I know that the Zigbee to MQTT Pi uses NTP. So it's probably that. The clock is actually out by an hour because it's not, I think the pie must be set to UTC rather than British summer time. I like mustn't be doing daylight savings, but it is correctly picking up the time, which is good. And as you can see, the number four has appeared. So it is correctly picking up the day of week as well, because it's currently Thursday and that it starts from a Monday. So yeah, that's the fourth day. So it is actually showing the day as well. So that's quite good. I mean, it, not that I use this, I'm not gonna use the built-in timers, but it does mean that at least it will automatically set the clock on this. So if the system does go down, the time will actually be correct to let me use the timers. And it also just means that if I'm looking at it, walking past, there will be an accurate clock here. Well, a clock is out by an hour, but the clock will actually have a time on it. It won't just be sitting, counting the number of minutes since it was last switched on. So yeah, seems to work. Now time to go and install this. Okay, so here we can see my old system. In the hallway, all we've got is this little box here. And that just contains a little temperature and humidity sensor module that connects the sun off. 
There's also a little blue LED that's quite hard to see under these bright lights, but there's a little blue LED here that's currently on, and that just shows the state. So I've got it set if it's the heating's turned up, like turned on but not running the boiler, the light comes on solid. If the boiler's firing, it, it blinks, just that sort of stuff. So I'll be taking this out and fitting a Patris box in this wall, and I'll mount the Mohs Zigbee thermostat on the wall out here. So here we are on the other side of that wall, so the sensor's just through here, and that black cable that plugs into the sawn off is actually the other end of that sensor. We've then got the sawn off here that's doing the actual smart switching and connecting to Wi-Fi and stuff like that. This is running custom firmware that I wrote. We've then got this double pole switch here with a flex outlet. This is just purely for neatness so it can connect the sawn off and lets me turn the sawn off off to switch it off if I'm not using it or if I need to reset it or restart it if it crashes or whatever. People in the previous video got very upset because this wasn't a fuse connection unit but it doesn't actually need to be a fuse connection unit because this whole thing here is actually fed from my boiler and that boiler is then powered through a fuse connection unit with a 3 amp fuse in it. So there's no need to have another fuse here. This is purely just, this could just be a flex outlet without a switch. I just happened to put a switched one in just so I could yeah, restart this on off. But you can see here one of the flaws I had was that because the system has no local control, if my network was ever down, which happened a couple of times when I was like trying to reconfigure the network, I couldn't actually control my heating at all. So I ended up actually installing this very cheap manual thermostat. I did this back when I did the migration to Unify. The network was going to be out for a long time and it was very cold. So I actually ran out and bought this thermostat and I've wired it in parallel with the sawn off. So if either this is on or the sawn off's on, the heating will turn on. So it means I can use this manual thermostat to just override this whole system if it ever goes down. So that's the benefit with the new one is because it has full local control. I won't need this anymore because it can just control itself. So what I'll do now is I'll go away off camera rip all of this out and then get the system back to like a, the sort of state you'd expect if you're taking an existing heating programmer out rather than this sort of custom system and then we'll take a look at how we'll install the new heating programmer. It's actually going to be a bit of a shame to see this go because you know I, I did put a lot of effort into this I mean this is running custom firmware that I wrote and everything and it was actually a very popular video as well but fancy a bit of a change try something a bit new and yeah I'm, I'm not going to be throwing this out or repurposing this I'm probably going to keep this as like a sort of example of a project that I did so Yep, time to rip all this out and fit the new one. Okay, so that's all the old stuff pulled out. We've got the sawn off, the switch, the old sensor unit, the old thermostat, back box, just various other bits. So that's all out. Now it's time to put the new one in. Okay, so now that's all removed, let's install the new system. Now, first of all, a boring bit first is just a big disclaimer, and that is that I'm not an electrician, do not try this at home. Doing something like this is totally possible, but you need to really understand how your whole heating system works and you need to have a good working knowledge of electrics and also this will massively vary between countries so don't just try and copy this video or do this at home this is not intended as like a installation guide treat it more like a vlog of my installation and the main focus is really just the actual thermostat hardware itself and the software side of it this is not an installation guide on how to set this up so do not copy this and try this at home but I thought I may as well show what I'm doing so what I've got here is we've got essentially what I originally had when I moved in. I've taken the old, the old, the, well, the old new system, the, the, I've taken my homemade smart system out and then sort of restored this back to how it originally was when I moved in. What I had was this Honeywell programmer that just sat like that. It's a very dumb programmer, nothing smart about it at all, that sat there. And then we had this three core and earth wire going into it. What we've got here is this is obviously three core and earth. There is obviously the earth, a permanent live, and a switch live. So the permanent live is obviously always powered on. And then the switch live is what's switched on and off by the relay in the programmer. And that's what turns a boiler on or off. This will obviously vary between systems. My system uses a mains voltage signal to the boiler. Other systems will use low voltage systems, vo low voltage signals. So you won't switch a permanent live to the boiler. You'll have almost like two wires coming from the boiler and you connect them together. And that will either be low voltage or it'll be like zero volt contacts. And that's why you need to be careful because if you did something like if you copy my wiring here for mains voltage system and then you wire live mains into your low voltage input on your boiler, you're going to blow your boiler up. So yeah, don't copy this. And that's all I had on the original program because the original one, original one was battery operated. But there was because it was three core and earth, there was this additional grey wire here. So I've now set that up as a neutral and that's what used to power the sun off. So now we've got the same sort of wires here. So all we need to do now is, well, install a new thermostat in its place. Now, this obviously was just, the original thermostat was just, uh, or programmer was just screwed straight to the plasterboard. The new one is designed to flush mount into a Patris box. So what I'll do is I'll cut this plasterboard out here and install a Patris box. And then in theory, we can just 
my new programmer straight on it. Okay, so now I cut the wall out and put a Patras box in. And I was actually very lucky. When I cut the wall out, it turns out there's actually, turns out there's actually like a wooden batten behind here. And it's not structural. It's clearly the sort of batten they've put in to mount, other, mount back boxes onto, like all the other ones have the same thing behind them. So I suspect maybe at first fix they've not known what sort of programmer they were going to put in. So they've put those battens in just in case they wanted to use a recessed programmer. And then they obviously ultimately haven't used it. So that's meant that rather than using a plastic dry lining box, I've actually been able to use a metal one. And this is kind of good for two different reasons. First of all, this plasterboard here is totally knackered. Like, what's happened is when they've obviously wanted to pull the initial, pull the cable out the wall, they've clearly just like stabbed it with a screwdriver or hit it with a hammer to make that hole in it. And like when I was cutting it out, it was just breaking out in chunks. And it means that like the edge here and the edge here, it's actually really thin because it was all cracked and crumbling away behind. So it's fine, like it's not a problem, but I wouldn't want to be trying to clip a dry lining box into this because it's probably actually too broken and too thin to like really sit on sit on well. And even though it's not getting like the forces on it like you would with a socket, it, yeah, it just it didn't feel right using that because it would just be really fragile. The other, other benefit as well that's probably me, me being more paranoid than anything is that this is metal. And even though it's not a fireproof dry lining box, like it's not fire rated at all, and you know, I'd like to think the programmer is fairly safe, the programmer does have an active power supply sitting behind it that would be sitting inside the wall cavity. And I feel much more comfortable at least just having it surrounded by metal, because that then means that if it did overheat and start melting or whatever, it's at least going to sort of be mostly contained within this metal rather than sitting in you know, a plastic box. So, because obviously this you know, is a stud wall, there is wood in here. So yeah, pretty happy with that. And then as you can see, I've you know, put a grommet in the top, brought the three corner earth through, and I've just connected the earth onto the back box because the programmer itself doesn't need earth. So I've just done that just to earth the back box. And what we've now got, as, we've, as we had before, we've got the brown for the permanent live, the black for the switch live, and the gray for the neutral. The neutral is quite short, so I'll need to see. I, th I think I'll be able to get it on. If not, I'll have to um, put a Wago on it and join it, but I think I might be able to get away with it. But yeah, th I've not got any more slack on this, unless, unless I maybe go up into the ceiling and try and maybe unclip a cable clip and pull more down, but I'll try and manage with this, because there is enough slack on these two. It's maybe just the neutral's maybe a little bit short, but hopefully it'll be okay. So, now time to go away and actually fit the programmer. Okay, this is all now wired up. And just again to reiterate, do not do try this at home. Do not copy what you can see here because this is obviously specific to my system and my wiring. Your property could be totally different, but you know the colors could potentially be the same. So yeah, don't try and replicate this at home. But all what we've got here is again, earth onto the back box as before. We've got the neutral coming straight into the programmer, which is a bit tight, but it does still fit fine, so it's okay. Then we've got the permanent live going into the live on the programmer. And then we've got the switch live coming out, sleeves up brown, and that's coming out of this relay contact here. You'll also notice there's this additional wire here. That's because as it says here, this is a dry contact. So unlike the Sonoff and some other programmers, you don't, the, the live going in isn't switched to the output. The output is just two terminals that are switched by a relay and there's no voltage on that. So what this wire does here is it connects into the live terminal here, the permanent live, and brings it over to one side of the relay. And, and then, so that then means when the relay switches on, the other side of the relay here switches to live. So you just need, sort of need to do that, but that's fine. That's common for programmers that have dry contacts. In fact, I think even the Hive, the Hive that I installed in the previous video, that didn't have dry contacts because it was a heating and hot water version. But the Hive that's heating only, I think actually does have dry contacts. So you need to do the same thing. But yeah, that's now installed there. So all I need to do now is get this put back on the wall and then we can attach the front panel on because I've pulled that off to make it easier to install. So yeah, time to do that. Okay, so that's all now installed. I think the only thing I would say if you get one of these is don't use the screws it comes with. It, well, at least if you're in the UK. It comes with these two screws, which clearly are designed to go into a back box of some sort because they're not self-tapping, they're, you know, machine screws. But these are M4 size, whereas UK Patris boxes use M3.5. And the problem with that is that they're close enough in size that if you put them in and, like, turn them and, you know, force them a little bit, it'll re-thread the hole in the back box and then it'll go in. But what you're doing there is you're setting yourself up for pain in the future when you inevitably try and replace the thing, try and use a new socket that's come with the screws or whatever, and the holes are too wide and they've been just like damaged, because then you have to replace the whole box. So I just went and found a couple of screws that I had sitting around for obviously from a different socket or something, and that's they fitted absolutely fine. So just bear in mind that if you're buying one of these, 
you will need to try and find new M3.5 screws. I mean, it's the same screws you'll have from any other electrical accessory, but yeah, don't use the screws it comes with because they'll damage your back box. But now we've got the front plate, so we can put it on. So you just need to line the connector up, so that's that way up, and that can just plug in there. It's a little bit fiddly. It'd be easier, obviously, if I wasn't leaning over the camera, but if I can come around here and try and get that in. Cool, so that's the front plate back on. And now we can hopefully put it in. So the yep, connector in the back seems secure. And all we need to do now is line it up on the wall and slide it down. There we go. That fits absolutely fine. And maybe be careful if you're screwing that to the wall that you don't accidentally cause your the back plate to like sink in. So like, you know, if you've put a, a metal patch response, especially like mine, if there's too much plasterboard cut out behind it, you run the risk of that sinking back into the wall and then it won't hook over very well. But for me here, it's been absolutely fine. So yeah, that goes on there. Put it down securely and that's now installed and that looks really good. Let's see how level I got it because the back plate was level. Just check this is level as well. Totally not level. There we go. Just needed to push the other side down. Yeah, that's fine. Cool. So that's now installed. So now let's try powering this up. So that's it there. Just gonna go in here and turn the heating circuit on and hopefully this will turn on and not explode. There we go, the program has started up. So that has worked perfectly well. It clicked and turned on. The, the boiler's actually, sw I've switched the boiler off just so my playing about here won't turn it on and off. But yep, it's now trying to heat. It's picked up the time correctly, presumably over Zigbee. I can, you know, decrease the set temperature. And if I turn that right down, the heating should turn off. Yep, so symbol's gone away and I just heard a click up. It clicks a little bit after the symbol goes away. But that's installed and seems to work. So if we can now do the satisfying peel. There we go. And there's my new, new heating programmer. And that looks really neat there. Okay, so there we go, that's all installed and it works absolutely fine. You turn it on, turn it off, change the temperature, all that's fine. So what I need to do is I need to go away off camera and I'll start doing all the no dread stuff. So I'll set up the no dread flows, build a dashboard and get it working. And then I'll come back. But I'm really happy with it. It looks really good there. And it will be nice having that manual control of the temperature so I can just, or, you know, physical control of the temperature so I can walk over and adjust it and I don't need to get my phone out. So yeah, definitely pretty happy with it. Okay, so I've gone away and set up some flows in no dread and got it working. So let's take a look at it. What we'll do is we'll take a look at the actual dashboard and the interface I've built now. And then afterwards, we're going to take a look at Node Red and actually look at the flow I've built. I won't go into a huge amount of detail because there's going to be better videos of Node Red out there, but I'll show how I've built this. But what I'll do is I'll show it working first, just to give you an idea of how the operations kind of set up, and then you can see it. Then hopefully the flows will then make more sense. So we've got the thermostat on the wall here, and that works absolutely fine. And on the right of your screen, you can see the phone, the Node Red UI interface running on my phone. And I thought I'd show the phone version because it's a really good responsive interface and works really well on mobile, which is how I'll probably be using this the most. So if you look at the phone here, we can see we've got a few options. It's very simple just now, but I can obviously change this and expand it over time. But at the top, we can see we've got a switch for saying the heating's on or off. If I were to toggle that, you'll see the thermostat screen will go off because heating's off. The thermostat screen will go on, go on if I press that and turn it on. And you can see the UI element also adjusts. And what's really good with this is the UI also reflects state changes on the device itself. So for example, if I were then to go onto the thermostat itself and turn it off, you'll see in a second, the heating switch on the interface in Node Red will also turn off. So it means I can use that local, local control here, which is good. Turn that back on, wait a second, and it'll update in Node Red. Below that, I've then got timer on. This is how I can, this allows me to turn the heating on and off automatically. It's just timers and you can see they're down here. Now, because I'm just using a pre-made Node-RED scheduler UI element, this doesn't really have the ability to set t different temperatures at different times. I could easily do that, but I would have to build my own Node-RED UI element, so I'd have to build the, so essentially the front-end HTML and JavaScript to do that. I might do that in the future, but for now it's not really worth it. I mean, even with my old system that did let me do that, realistically I had one timer that switched on in the morning, and then one timer that switched on in the evening, and they both were at the same temperature, so it didn't really bother me. So I don't really need that. So yeah, when the timer is enabled, that'll toggle the heat on, heating on automatically. So it'll switch the thermostat on and off. Otherwise, if the timers are off, I'll just have to manually toggle it. 
But what this does mean is I can kind of use the heating on toggle or the button on the front of the thermostat as kind of like a schedule advance option. So for example, the, heat, the timer currently says that the heating should be on. But if I want the heating to be off because I'm going out or I'm going to bed early or something, I can turn heating off in the interface here. Or if I'm, say, walking out the door, I can come over to the thermostat and just press the button on the front and that'll turn the heating off. But with the timer still enabled, what that then means is that when the timer period finishes and the timer's meant to switch the heating off, it'll turn it off, but it's already off, so it won't make a difference. But then in the morning, when the, t the schedule says the heating's to be turned on, it'll turn it on again. Likewise, if the heating was off currently and the timer said that the heating should be off, but I wanted it on, all I need to do is press the button here or in the mobile interface, and that'll turn the heating on. Next time the timer says that the heating should be on, it'll just try to turn it on, but it'll already be on. But then when the timer says to switch it off, it'll turn it off. So being able to use the heating on toggle in the interface or the button on the front just to kind of advance the schedule will actually be really useful. Next up, we've got the temperature control. This is just very basic because I've not got separate temperatures for different times. So I've just got one global thermostat. And as you can see here, all I can do is just use the button here and that will let me change the temperature. So you can see when I press the button on the interface, it updates immediately on the thermostat. And as you can see, because I've turned it up above the current ambient temperature, the little smoke coming out of the chimney, steam out of the chimney things come on, and that's showing that the heating's firing. Now, it won't do that currently. I've switched the boiler off just so I don't turn it on and off repeatedly with this test, but you can see there it's now turned on. And I can also turn the temperature up. And if I was to turn the set point down, we'll see in a second, it'll turn off. So it's doing exactly what it was doing on the table, but now it's wired in. The only weird thing I found is that on this, it's over MQTT, I can only adjust the temperature in whole numbers. If I try and send it like 18.5, so a sort of half degree, it just sets the temperature in the thermostat to zero, which is actually lower than it can normally go, so it can normally only go down to five. So I think that's a weird bug there. So through the mobile interface or through Node-RED, I can only set it in one degree increments, which is a little bit annoying, but I'll live with it. It's just annoying because obviously on the interface here, you can actually put it up in 0.5 increments. But what you can see is if I say set this to 23, you'll see the mobile interface in a second will actually update the temperature reading to actually reflect that new temperature. It takes a few seconds, but it does actually work. So that means that I can also adjust the thermostat on here in person standing in front of it or, on, or through Node-RED and it'll update the thermostat both times. So it means I've not, I've not got different state on the thermostat and on Node-RED, they actually correctly update to reflect each other. And likewise, the heating's currently on. If I were then to turn the timers off, the timers will turn off, and then in a second, the heating will also turn off as well. So if I disable the timers, the whole system will switch off. But with the timers disabled, what I could then do is I could come on and go, right, I want the heating on manually, press the button, it'll turn on, and it'll turn on without needing the timers. So it works really well. It's just a little bit annoying about not being able to set the temperature in five degree, uh, 0.5 degree imp increments. Finally, in the web interface, you can see there's a temperature reading. That's just a little gauge, nothing fancy at all. And then below that, I've got a temperature history graph. And that works really well too. The only thing I found is that on my old system, the sensor was really accurate and it could measure, I think, in 0.1 degree increments. Whereas this one, I presume the temperature sensor is fairly accurate, but it only broadcasts temperature changes in 0.5 degree increments. So this graph is quite stepped. It jumps half a degree every time. Whereas if we look at an example from my previous inter previous hardware, because I did briefly try that in Node-RED, you can see the graph's a lot smoother and it was a bit nicer. It gave you a bit more information, a bit more detail. But it doesn't make a huge deal. I mean, if I, did, if I really cared, I could just buy a separate Zigbee temperature sensor just to get a nice graph. But this does the job fine. So yeah, it's really good having this, both the Node-RED remote control and the local control and they both reflect each other so I can use them both together and not worry about stuff going out of sync. The only other thing I found is when I was talking about this on, on the table, I showed how you could switch this into timer mode. Now, as I mentioned, you can't set the timers that actually run on this over MQTT. I presume you can using it over Zigbee, but obviously someone hasn't reverse engineered the protocol enough to do that yet. So the risk with that would be if someone were to press the button on this to put it into timer mode, this could then end up sitting, responding, like turning on and off to timers that are programmed into it that I don't even know what they are, it's just the defaults. And this could kind of then just be switching itself on and off randomly, even if the node red is telling the heating to be off. So what I've done, so what I've done with that 
is I've just put a, ba a basic block in Node Red, we'll see in a second, that just says that if this is ever switched out of manual mode, so if it's ever switched into timer mode, to switch it back into manual mode. So we can see that here, there's a little hand symbol that shows it's in manual mode. If I were to then press this little button here, which would put it into timer mode, you'll see the clock appears, but then it jumps back to the hand. And that's Node Red doing that. So when I press this, Node Red sees that I've changed it to timer mode and then kicks it back into manual mode. So it won't be possible for someone to accidentally press that button and put it into timer mode if Node Red's working. However, that's only if Node Red's running. So for example, if Node Red died or stopped working or had a network issue, I would then be able to put this into timer mode. That means that this will still work even if my whole network's down. So if my whole network's down, Node Red's not working or whatever, I can just come over to this, switch heating on and off manually, of course, but I could also come in and in a, pit, in a pinch, set some timers on it, flip into timer mode, and it will just act as a basic dumb programmer. So that'll be good just in the event that my network goes down, I can still continue to control the heating, even with timers now, without having to use that old manual thermostat I had installed. Because while that manual thermostat did work, it didn't let me set timers, for example. So at least with this, if I have an issue for a prolonged period of time where my network's not working or whatever, I don't need to worry about fixing it urgently to get timers back. I'll be able to set up some timers on this if I had to. So yeah, that's a look at the thermostat there and how it all behaves and a bit quick look at the interface. So let's quickly take a look at it turning on the boiler just to prove it does actually work. And then we'll take a look at Node Red. Okay, so I'm currently in the kitchen with the boiler. So forgive the dodgy sound quality and lighting. But let's check this actually works and controls the boiler. So the main thing to notice right now on the boiler is just that it's got a zero on the screen which indicates that it's off. And then there's a LED to the right of that that says burner. And that'll flash when the boiler's actually firing. So here in Node Red we can see the heating's off and the timer's currently off. So we turn the heating on, we can press this button here. It takes a little second to update because it has to go to the thermostat and then get a signal back saying it's back, it's turned on. So this actually reflects the state because it's verified by the thermostat. Heating's now on. However, we can see it's currently 20 degrees as sensed by the thermostat and the temperature set to 19 degrees, so the boiler isn't firing. But if we increase this temperature to 21 degrees, wait a couple of seconds, heard a click from the thermostat in the hallway, and we see the boiler's firing. So we can see the seven segment display on the left is now saying C, which it does, I think it means central heating, and then you see the burner lights flashing. And as you may be here in the background, that boiler's firing up. So there we go. And now likewise, if I come into here and I go right, turn heating off. That'll turn off. It'll sort of sit and flash and do stuff for a little while. It doesn't immediately turn off. It sort of goes through a routine and stuff. But as you can see, that thermostat correctly controls an actual boiler. So yeah, it fully works. Okay, so here we are in Node Red. And I won't go into too much detail on this because obviously it's you know, very complicated and there's probably much better videos out there from people that fully understand Node Red. But I'll take a quick look at how it works. Now with MQTT, all I'm doing is I'm just receiving this full status updates from the heating controller because it sends out regular updates containing our JSON object containing all the data. So it contains its current temperature, the heating set point, the state, all that sort of stuff. And generally when you make a change to the device where you like press a button on it, it will send out one of those messages. And then it also sends them out periodically just when the temperature changes and things like that. So we receive that in here over MQTT. We then parse that as JSON. These blocks here just filter that. So all they really just do is they just take one item from that. So that JSON object contains all the different temperatures and set points. These blocks here literally just take that and just split it out and just pass out a single value. So this one, for example, passes out the current set point. This one takes in the current system mode, which is whether it's on or off essentially. And that comes in either as the word heat or off. So this converts that to true or false and passes it into here. And then these states then go into the form controls. So for example, the heating set point when it comes in is used to update the form control for the thermostat temperature or the, or the system mode gets passed into the heating on switch. So that means if I turn it off at the physical device, that message comes in here and will toggle the actual form control. Up here, there's also just the, you know, the temperature readings come in and they're just basically put onto that, for that dial and that graph display. And that's all they do. We don't actually do any sort of thermostat style logic here. That's all done standalone by the actual hardware itself. 
So all we do here is just collect it and present it. We also have to filter extreme values here. I just had a weird case where like, I think when I first restart the thermostat, the current temperature reading is some huge number. I think it's like an overflow or something. And that then would put a big spike in the graph and make it look stupid. So I've just, I just filter any really high temperatures. Then all we do here is then messages come out of this. They then get wrapped up in different forms. For example, we take the thermostat temperature and we wrap it into a message of JSON like this, where we basically put the temperature in a JSON object with the key current heating set point. Or down here, we convert the Boolean value back to the words heat or off. And then we again wrap that in some JSON. And then all these JSON outputs then get passed into this MQTT topic here, which is just the heating controller set object or set topic. And that will set the value on the programmer. So it's actually really simple. And the cool thing here is ignoring some stuff down here. All of this logic here is done purely with node red blocks with no JavaScript functions, which compared to the lighting system I did in my previous video, it's a lot simpler. There's a lot less JavaScript going on here. Heating was a little bit, uh, timers were a little bit confusing, but I've been able to do it. So all we do down here is it just on, it's on reboot. So if the system's ever restarted or I deploy a flow, it loads and it reads this file off the disk, which is just a JSON file and passes it into the heating timers um, UI element. And that's that scheduler element you saw on the screen. And that will restore this from, restore the timers from that file on restart. And then if I change any of those timers, which I can do through the web interface, it will then write those out to, to that file again. And that just makes the heating timers persistent across reboots, which is quite important. Then out of, out of the bottom sort of attachment on this node, what this does is this basically passes true the, the binary value true or false depending on whether the heating should be turned on or off based on the timer. So that passes true or false out of here, and that goes into this JavaScript function. All this function does is it just looks at the timer on switch and works out whether the timer on switch is turned on. If the timer on switch is turned on, then the values from the timer itself get passed through to turn the system mode on or off, because that could be turning the heating on or off. If the timer is disabled, none of those messages come out. And that means that the heating can be toggled using this heating on control here without the timer turning the heating on or off. So it just basically, it's, it's like a filter. It'll only allow the messages to pass through if, timer, if the timer is switched on. There's then other, some other basic deduplication stuff in here just to stop it sending the same message out multiple times, turn it on or off because that was causing issues. Then down here for timer on, this is the, that timer on form control. When you press that, all it does is call this JavaScript function that just saves that. It just saves the timer on state into a variable, which is then read by this function. And then again, does some deduplication stuff. And then finally here, we've got this little thing here that just says, if the timer on switch is false, so if it's been turned off, we then want to pass, this, pass that message on to turn the heating off. So that means that if I turn the timers on, it won't affect the current heating state. But if the heating's currently on and I turn the timers off, it will also turn the heating off. So it's all relatively simple. I don't know why that's there. I think I'll put it there by accident. But yep, it's dead simple. There's not much complexity here at all. I mean, obviously this potentially looks complex if you've not used Node-RED before, but Node-RED, once you get your head around how it works and the sort of way of thinking behind it, it's not too bad. I won't go into too much detail on that anymore because again, there are going to be much better videos of Node-RED out there. But yeah, that's a quick example of it all working. So there you go. That was a look at my smart central heating control system that I've built totally self-hosted using Node-RED, Zigbee to MQTT, and this Zigbee thermostat. And it works really well. There's definitely some tweaks I want to do to the software. There's a few different ways I could do stuff. For example, currently I turn this thermostat off when I don't want the heating on. Whereas what I might want to do instead is just set the set temperature set point between like five degrees at the minimum if I want the heating essentially off and then up to a more sensible temperature if I want it on. And then that way the screen will always be on and it'll kind of have a bit of frost protection and stuff. So there's a lot of tweaks I might want to do to the software in the future, but there's a basic version of it all working. And yeah, I'm very happy with it. I do still really like my old system. I'm very proud of that, but it's quite nice being able to do this with a totally off the shelf device. And then the fact that this will give me full manual control, including timer control without no dread working is going to be really good. It just means that if I ever do take the system down or I want to change stuff, for example, if I do want to make significant changes to the software side of things, I can do that, yet still actually use the heating from a local device, which will be really good as well. And yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. So there you go. Thank you very much for watching. And if you're interested in buying any of the hardware shown in this video, there's a link in the description.